night. Realize the people around you are also in speech classes. Speech 100, 102, 104, 107, 120, you're all required to be here and we appreciate you coming here and supporting the speech team. For those individuals in the back that are standing, there are plenty of seats in the center section here and over there, there are seats. So please feel free to come and sit down because this will be a 90 minute show. I promise I'll get you out of here in 90 minutes. So you, if you have to make that last bus, you'll be able to make that last bus out of MJC. <laughs> But come on in, and sit down, relax. The Modesto Junior College Speech and Debate Team is the oldest competitive team on campus. We actually have a document from 1924 talking about the debate team here on campus. And we have a poster that shows that the Modesto Junior College debate team is going to hold a debate against UC Berkeley in the Modesto High School Auditorium back in the 1920s, which I always found pretty fascinating. I guess there wasn't an auditorium on the MJC campus at that time. The other really fascinating thing about the speech team is back in the 1920s in competition, we were the only community college debating against four-year universities. And at that time, the director of forensics was a Mr. Oscar Smith. And Oscar was a really strong debate coach because the Modesto Junior College students were beating the UC Berkeley teams consistently. So much so that UC Berkeley actually put forth a proposal at that point in time in competition that they do away with decisions in debate. And so let's just debate for the educational effort and let's not talk about who wins and loses because Berkeley was getting embarrassed that their debate team was losing to a junior college. <laughs> the best thing about being the director of forensics here at Modesto Junior College with that type of lineage is that you will meet debaters today who have also continued that tradition in beating UC Berkeley at tournaments. Mm -hmm. So, today we have speeches for those of you in 100, 102 classes. We have persuasive speeches and debate for those of you in 104 and 107 with critical thinking. And we even have an interpretation of literature for those of you in speech 120 interp classes or possibly some of you from the Reader's Theater classes that the speech department holds as well. But today, you're going to be meeting individuals who are some of the top right now in Northern California, because we just came home from our first tournament. And you'll also be meeting some individuals who are the top in the state and the nation for community college speech and debate students. We traditionally, over the past seven or eight years, have brought home students who are first or second or third in the nation in some of the events that you'll be seeing this evening. And that's a really proud feeling. And you should feel proud to be at a junior college that has that much type of talent because we've kept that up. For all of you in speech, if you are here on the East Campus, when you're up there on the second floor of Founders Hall, if you look at the wooden cabinet, those are all the national champions that have been here over the past few years. Uh, we even have instructors who are teaching here who used to be a national champion in third place in the nation in persuasive speaking at one point in time was Professor Michael Acard who now teaches in the English department. So sit back and relax and enjoy this evening. 
Certainly, I also have to recognize that I am never able to make this team the national champions that they are. I have help from individuals. Certainly, all of your speech instructors give me help throughout the year. Help to find the talent. Some of you sitting out there might be joining the team in the spring because your speech instructor comes to me and says, hey, I have a student in my class who I think could become your next state or national champion. And so some of you sitting out here and maybe watching speech night for the very first time, this is gonna be the beginning of your adventure. But also I have individuals who volunteer their time or they come in and help me assist with the team. Uh, the first individual I'll talk about is a, a multifaceted individual who loves poetry and reading and theater. And he also has been a track coach here at Modesto Junior College. And so please uh, give a round of thank you to Rob Taylor, one of my assistant coaches. And this year, for the very first time, I don't have to be the only director of forensics. I have a co-director of forensics. And so hopefully his students will make an even louder noise. But please give a round of applause to Mr. Daniel Lopez. Hello everyone and welcome to the MJC Forensics Team Speech Night. As you will notice, I am the only person not in a suit tonight. I was afraid that my baby face would convince you all that I was on the team. <laughs> Before we get started with introducing the team members, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the activity that we do and to remind all of you to embrace the challenge of public speaking. We often think of it as this intimidating activity, but developing a personal voice might be the most important skill you take out of your experience at MJC. And it is a personally liberating thing to conquer a fear, which is something that most of us feel towards public speaking. And the people who engage in this activity and who compete, you know, give up one, two, three weekends a month, they face that fear all the time in order to better their public speaking. And I would embrace you all to recognize that while you take that challenge on a smaller scale in your classes, that it's an important challenge to take up and that it can have a positive influence on your life. And hopefully, if it's a challenge you enjoy having in your classes, you'll join us at MJC Forensics and compete with all of our other uh, fun forensics obsessed people. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you the 2013-2014 Modesto Junior College Forensics Team. Starting on the far right, we have Melinda Dotson, joined by Emily Akers. Clarissa Autry. James Bow. Rachel Carr. Kelly Gay Kearley. Javier Coris, who some of you might recognize as your speech tutor. Paul Figueroa. Mikey Gonzalez. Holly Hasabakis. Jacob Holman. Nicole Twinker, Sterling Mays, Brittany McCall, Shannon McCall, Jamal Nagy, 
Michael Rorick, John Salmon, Ronald Thompson, Shannon Tower, and Montana Webb. Your 2013-2014 MJC Forensics Team. Uh, folks, if you have an empty seat next to you, could you please raise your hand? We need everyone to get out of the aisles so that we do not pose a fire hazard get shut down before we even get to watch people's feet. It'd be very tragic. Yeah, right? We can actually have our... Don't take it personally if people don't sit next to you. A lot of seats. Our first performer tonight will be showing you an event that some of you may already be familiar with, or some of you may be getting ready to do in your classes, the informative speech. And the informative speech is what we call a public address event, or a PA for short. And its purpose is to inform the audience on a topic with which they might not already be familiar. Uh, today's speaker, Jacob Holman, will be doing his speech on mental imaging and the wonderful effects it will have on our future. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jacob Holm. Dog Cop is an industrial spy, one of the best. He is so good at his job that he can do it in his sleep, literally. Dog Cop, Dream Snatcher gets his intel from his victim's dreams. While the tools of Don Cobb's trade are purely from the imagination of Inception creator Chris Nolan, a September 9, 2013 article from the Singularity Weblog website, a science think tank, explains that there is an emerging field of science that may make this possible. That field is mental image decoding, or mental imaging for short. According to a popular science website article on September 12, 2013, mental imaging scientists can use mental imaging to see what you dream. And may provide new insights into the process of dreaming that could possibly break one of the longest mysteries in human biology, why we dream. Described by university professor Andrew Reed in his online publication, Science in Our World, as mind-blowing. Mental imaging is an impactful field with immeasurable potential, which is why we need to effectively and cautiously evaluate its possibilities that are emerging before our very eyes. To conduct a proper evaluation, we will first doze off as we learn about what mental imaging is. Then, we will drift off to dreamland as we watch its applications before finally waking up to the reality of its implications. So in order to do this, let's lay down our heads as we let's lay down our heads as we unravel the process of mental imaging and do this by examining the process of neural decoding. According to the Dana Foundation, in a briefing paper on August 30th, 2013, neural decoding is the process that scientists use to determine which neurons are in the brain are affected when introduced to different stimuli. Mental imaging scientists use a functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, scanner to take snapshots of brain activity, creating a library of neural information to be used for reconstructing what image is currently being viewed. The UC Berkeley Department of Systems and Computational Neuroscience explains that in order to project a mental image from the brain, first, the neural information is put into a computer program 
produce visual imagery on a computer monitor. Then, the scientists check the accuracy by comparing the image reconstruction with the actual image the subject observed. Second, mental imaging has a close cousin in dream projection. According to the Guardian website, on April, 20, on April 5th, Yukiyasu Kamitani of the ATR Computational Neuroscience Laboratories in Kyoto, Japan, and his colleagues conducted an experiment by which they were able to use fMRIs, adding electroencephalography, to, con to predict the content of a dream with 80 to 85% accuracy. In addition, an instructional video by biologists Michael Moffat and Gregory Brown on June 3rd discussed an earlier experiment by Dr. Kamitani's lab, demonstrating that when shown pictures of simple pixels, black and white, like the letter T, the image was fed into the computer program software and then stored in its library. Then, the subjects were shown a simple string of letters and produced fairly accurate reconstructions. Now that we've dozed off learning about mental imaging, we can now rapidly move our eyes over the applications, constructing external and physical manifestations of mental images. Mental imaging presents a unique opportunity to, cons to manifest mental images from inside the brain. This can be done through mediums such as visual display monitors, 3D or image projectors, and 3D printers. According to an August 16, 2013 personal interview with UC Berkeley professor Jack Belong of Systems and Computational Neuroscience, each of these, each of these mediums will allow a person to externally manifest the image present in their brain until they choose to stop. In the case of 3D printers, this will enable the making of physical constructs for practical use, such as printing that furniture you have always imagined for your home. In other cases, mental imaging would enable those unable through, artistic, through lack of artistic skill or through physical ability to reproduce the image present in their minds. Now, a more futuristic application of mental imaging is touchable holograms. According to the University of Tokyo's Shinoda Labs website, on April 30th, 2013, ultrasonic waves, sound waves that are used, sound waves beyond human hearing, are used to create pressure against other objects, effectively creating physical objects out of sound. According to an interview by NTDI News with Hiroyuki Shinoda, professor at Tokyo University on July 30th, 2011, touchable holograms have a wide range of uses, from light switches to tables that can appear when needed and disappear when unneeded. Finally, let's reduce our rapid eye movement and wake up to the realities that await us by evaluating the implications of mental imaging. The most prominent implications of mental imaging are that it will better our understanding of brain function. How private persons will function with this technology and present legal and ethical issues through, through extreme levels of social monitoring. On May 10th, 2013, Close One Journal article on neurological structure explains that the structure of the human brain is built on a modular architecture meaning that the parts of the brain that perform separate tasks are all linked together. The article further explains that this means when one area of the brain is better understood, we gain a better understanding of all other areas as well. As we advance our understanding, we will be able to make breakthroughs in other areas of the brain, leading to greater precision in difficult brain surgeries, more accurate and precise psychological evaluations, as well as better understanding of how pharmacological drugs will affect the brain. However, beyond all of these amazing accomplishments, the Journal of Visual Impairment and Blindness from July 2012 reveals a monumental breakthrough. Mental imaging technology will finally allow us to see what the blind see. 
Next, the legal hazards are a major concern. U.S. citizens are not protected against neural decoding by the government. Nita Fairman, Leah Kaplan Visiting Professorship in Human Rights, explained in, explained in a lecture at Stanford University on April 26, 2012, that under the current interpretations of the First, Fourth, and Sixth Amendments, U.S. citizens are not protected against mental imaging by the government. In addition, this will have ramifications on property and copyright laws, as we will be able to reproduce thoughts in order to determine the original owner of a particular property. According to an article by the University of Texas Pan American Department of Biology, last accessed September 16, 2013, brain imaging technology presents the possibilities of determining if a person is lying, concealing information, or has predispositions to particular behaviors. And this is just at the present levels. Ethics will have to be rewritten because it has never been possible to take such vivid information so directly from the brain. In our interview, Dr. Nguyen explained that beyond simple interrogation of people, this technology will make thought police a reality. However, unlike the fictional unit from Orwell's 1984, these police would have the ability and right to scan your mind for information. Fortunately, Dr. Gallant believes that medical applications for this technology are approximately 10 years down the road, 20 years for specialized applications, and 50 years for commercial applications. The time delay will allow for our ethics and legal systems to be able to account for and adjust to this field. Today, we have seen our once science fiction work becoming a reality. First, we laid down in order to learn about what mental imaging is and how it's done. Then, we rend over the applications before finally waking up to the realities of a dreamlike world. Now, as fun as it might be to be Dom Cobb, dream snatcher, it seems that it will be a long time before anyone can use dreams as a form of espionage. However, it might not be so long before you can finally turn your world, figuratively and literally, into everything you have ever dreamed of. Georgetown. 
And it was either that year or the next, he was voted by the freshmen as their favorite professor. No, no, he did not come in my room. Caitlin, please, these were the dark ages. You couldn't have any in Kai's in your room unless you wanted to get thrown out. Okay, well, he was always kind of weird. This one time we went to this nice club in Georgetown with music and food and dancing, and your father lies down on one of those benches by the doors. The man lies down flat on his back and asks me if I'll put nose drops in for him. I, I was mortified. His head was kind of leaning over the side of the bench. The drops would go in. And I did it. No letters, no cards. Um, mere romance wasn't exactly his forte. We liked going to the movies. Looking back on it now, it probably was a lot of fun because we didn't have to talk that much. I don't know, but I liked speaking to him intellectually, you know, on an intellectual level. But I don't think we ever really connected on an emotional level. I think that he had a hard time showing emotion of any kind. I had a strict Catholic upbringing. I went to an all-girls school, so men were always this mysterious thing over there. I really grew up thinking that men had all the questions and knew all of the answers, and that I had to catch up. We were both Roman Catholics. We came from Catholic families and a Catholic environment. So it wasn't, so you got married, you had kids. It wasn't a question of wanting, it was a question of you did. We got married at the OLPH, Our Lady of Perpetual Health. Boy, did we ever need it. He enjoyed cleaning. He loved my food. Before kids we had, I think I told you about the gourmet cooking club we started. Gourmet, being that you had to follow the gourmet magazine recipe. We didn't care what it was. You just had to follow it. When we first started, he wanted to be president. I thought, that's great. I love politics. But then my views changed. I had four kids. And my focus became, what can I give them? He was forever painting something. One of our hanging men told me once, he paints too much. I said, I know. Our house is getting smaller and smaller because there's so many coats of paint on the walls. I was always so scared I was going to mess up. You know, with a napkin roll or something. One of the biggest fights we ever had, your father insisted on getting a smaller car. I said to the salesman, how many people does this fit? He said, four. Your father thought that we only had two kids. I said, that's great. We've got four. The guy just stared at me. And I stared at your father, and we left. Your father screamed at me the entire way home. I mean, he screamed at me the entire way home. That's the reason we never went anywhere. Once my mother was watching all of you guys, I came up to meet up the city. I got off the bus and he met me there. And he said, I don't want to talk about the kids. I want to talk about something else. I don't want to hear about the kids. And I was just so hurt. I never mentioned divorce to my mother. I would have been too ashamed. You just don't do that in a Catholic family. I had no idea that other people didn't live like this. I thought, maybe that's what marriage was. We were visiting the parents in Mammoth. Things were bad.
Remember loading up the car with me. Can you stay here with me tonight? And she said no. <coughs> so I got in the car with him and we drove away. Caitlin, you do not understand his rage. He once got so angry at me that he ripped the phone off the wall and threw it at me. He wanted to move to DC to look for work. I'm not going with you. What was there to say? We hadn't talked our entire marriage. He said, you knew I was like this when you married me. You knew what kind of person I was. You knew. And I said, I don't care what you do. That's it. And he basically never spoke to me again. He didn't want anything. He just wanted to walk away. Did I tell you how we took the hair dryer? Sure. Okay, it was one of your first convenience, and he left me that weekend with four kids and no hair dryer. You were five, and if you sat, you curled your legs up underneath yourself. You absolutely pulled up to Mr. Sullivan. Oh, he was the guard at the it just means that he lied to the court. He was to report back on what kind of home life I was providing. If Mr. Sullivan was on the couch, he would snuck up next to him. So I think that you missed something. But it was something that you never had. Because you would never snuggle with your dad. Oh my goodness, it's like night and day. I can breathe. I can literally breathe when we got a divorce and he left. But you know what? I felt that way when he died, too. The night he died, there was a horrible storm in Massachusetts. There was thunder and lightning and it raged. And I thought, oh God, let him in to not send him back. I thought the heavens were railing against the fact that he was going up there. I thought, oh shit, we can't get him back. I know, I know that wasn't nice, okay? But it's what I thought. I did go to his grave site. I drove down by myself. Yeah, no one wanted to go. And I just...
Thank you very much to Shannon and her wonderful performance of her dramatic interpretation. I hope it was entertaining and enlightening. In order to further our enlightenment, we will be continuing with a persuasive speech. And in light of giving you extra advice between informatives and persuasives, the key element you'll notice that is different in this speech from the first speech you saw will be the call to action that arrives at the end of the speech. It's one of the defining characteristics between persuasive and informative speaking. Persuasions will always ask the audience to do something or engage in some sort of action. So without further ado, we will introduce James Baugh, who will be doing his persuasive speech. In 2012, Lauren and mother Gracie Fowler was at her wit's end. She had exhausted all of her options to give her seven and eight-year-old children the Medicaid coverage that they were entitled, but kept getting denied. On August 15, 2012, Huffington Post reported that Gracie and her kids were not alone. 500,000 children in Florida are without health insurance, and cuts to Medicaid are largely to blame. While the Affordable Care Act might alleviate some of the concern around health care, the funding for important social programs is becoming harder and harder to come by as our government is looking to cut costs at all costs. Fortunately, a USA Today article from July 23rd, 2013 reveals a plan that could save our government billions, switching from the paper dollar to the dollar coin. This article puts these savings at some $4 billion over the next 30 years, but other articles put these savings as high as $13 billion. Now, $13 billion might just seem like a drop in the bucket, except a May 12, 2009 article from NPR reveals a study on the denomination effect, which shows that people are actually much more likely to spend coins than they are to spend bills. This shows that in following in the footsteps of many of the world's other major economies, there are numerous benefits to the United States in switching to the dollar coin in terms of our economy, our budget, and even our natural resources. To understand where these benefits come from, we must first examine the reasons why we have, so far, avoided replacing the dollar bill. Second, understand the effects of the transition to the coin, and finally, implement solutions that will allow us to fully reap the benefit of having a more efficient dollar. Now, if switching to the dollar coin is so good, why haven't we done it already? There are three main reasons perpetuating our love of the paper dollar. The initial cost of coin production, the cost of businesses, and public opinion. But let's start with the coins. A 2011 report from the Government Accountability Office shows that the cost of producing enough coins to fully phase out the dollar bill would be somewhere around $600 million. Now, the initial concern about this cost is that since the savings are projected to take place over 30 years, these estimates could prove to be wrong. If that were to happen, it could take much longer to recover this initial cost, if it gets recovered at all. Second, there's the cost of businesses. In the same Government Accountability Office report, major stockholders identified potential causes that could result as a, re as a result of the change. The, sh the, sh the short-term costs are upfront and obvious. Businesses would need to upgrade their coin storage capacity in order to accommodate the large influx of coins. They would also need to upgrade or modify any machines that don't currently accept the coin. However, a 2013 report entitled Time for Change by former Treasury Department Assistant Secretary Aaron Klein, this cost is shown to be small, as all federal agencies and government operated machines already accept the dollar coin, as well as any machine produced in the last 20 years by the National Automated Merchandising Association. In addition to this, the 2011 Wisconsin State Journal identified a long-term cost to the transportation industry in the form of heavier truckloads as a result of more coins, leading to lower gas mileage and higher fuel costs. Finally, Americans waver on scrapping the greenback. A 2011 Lincoln Park Strategies poll showed that 77% of Americans are against using the dollar coin, and only 10% think it would help the economy to switch. 
The power of public opinion has often proven itself to be crucial when it comes to big changes in society. And right now, it is overwhelmingly against the dollar coin. While the resistance to change might be strong, the benefits of switching over are too great to ignore, including the environmental impacts, the long-term savings to the government, and the significant economic stimulation. First, let's look at the environment. American paper currency is 25% linen and 75% cotton. Unfortunately, cotton is one of the world's dirtiest crops. According to a 2013 report by Living Green Magazine, cotton is responsible for 16% of global insecticide use, and over 90% of the pesticides used in cotton farming rate as above highly hazardous by the World Health Organization. Also, only 10% of the bill is recyclable, in contrast to a 100% recycle rate to the dollar coin. It is estimated, in time for change, that the amount of landfill waste generated by 30 years of production of the $1 bill would accumulate up to 164,700 metric tons of waste, the same amount produced by the entire city of Cincinnati last year. Switching to the dollar coin, not only greatly reduces our cotton use, but also greatly reduces our contribution to landfills. Second, there are large-scale economic benefits to the government in switching to the coin. Printing the dollar bill is horribly inefficient. According to the U.S. Bureau of Engraving and Printing, in 21 of the last 22 years, the dollar bill was the most produced bill, and over half of the bills produced in 2011. This popularity leads to a short lifespan, only between five and six years, according to the Federal Reserve. The dollar coin, on the other hand, is much more cost efficient. While it costs more per unit to produce, 18 cents, compared to the dollar bill's nine cents, the US Mint estimates the lifespan of the dollar coin to be between 25 and 30 years, roughly five times that of its paper counterpart. In fact, it is estimated that simply by switching to the dollar coin, our government can save between 5.5 billion, according to the GAO, and 13 billion, according to Time for Change, over the next 30 years. Furthermore, the denomination effect, established in a 2009 study by NYU Stern School of Business, shows that people are actually much more likely to spend coins than they are to spend bills, and spend more money when shopping with coins than they are when shopping with bills. In the first phase of the study, 63% of people given four quarters spent money while shopping, in comparison to only 21% of people given a dollar bill. In the second phase of the study, owners of five $1 coins spent 5% more money in comparison to owners of five $1 bills. This study shows a strong correlation between coin money and increased consumer spending, which is undoubtedly good for the economy. The other side of this economic growth comes from the vending machine industry. It is actually much easier for a machine to process a coin than it is to process a bill. In fact, it was estimated by the Dollar Coin Alliance in 2013 that simply by switching to the dollar coin, the vending machine industry would save hundreds of millions of dollars a year simply by not having $1 bills jam up their machines and require maintenance. By now, it should be clear that there are numerous benefits in switching to the dollar coin. So let's look at some examples to help make this a reality. Right now, there is a bill that will switch us to the coin, the 2013 Currency Optimization, Innovation, and National Savings Act, or COINS Act. You should contact your congressperson immediately and instruct your representative to vote in favor of the COINS Act to the benefit of both our budget and our environment. Second, we should all become more vested in the dollar coin. Actively asking for the coin from your bank can help increase the demand for this type of currency. According to Philip Field, former director of the U.S. Mint, after learning of the potential savings, two-thirds of Americans are on board with switching to the coin. But we can't just be in favor in a poll. We have to seek out and use these coins to show our representatives that we want this transition. Gracie Fowler was a single mother struggling against budget cuts to keep her kids healthy, alongside many other families in the same boat. Important social programs like Medicaid, 
need the extra funding that smart, money-saving plans can provide. Today, we looked at how you can help the government save money, simply by switching from the paper dollar to the dollar coin. We examined the barriers generating resistance to this change, counted the numerous beneficial effects of switching over, and even discovered some solutions to help encourage this shift in policy. Switching to the dollar coin won't solve all of this country's financial problems overnight, but it is an example of the type of intelligent policy making that our government has been sorely lacking to bring us out of this financial crisis. Not every child will receive the health care coverage that they need as a result of these savings. But those who do will see their lives impacted for the better, as they see that for once, their government counted them and made them a priority. Thank you. Our next event is an event that many of you would probably put as the top of the speech list for most intimidating speech. An impromptu speech, where you only have two minutes to prepare a five minute speech. And you don't know what you're gonna be talking about. Yee! <laughs> but Jacob Holman, who you saw with his informative speech, is actually one of the top impromptu speakers in Northern California uh, for community colleges and university students. To make sure that you realize that this is a legitimate experience that you're going through, now we get to a part of the show where we begin audience participation. Because what I need from you is topics that Jacob will be using in choosing one of three topics to give a five-minute speech on. So at first, what I'd like is if you have an idea of a political person, give me a political person. Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi. There we go. Good job. Quick, to the point. A movie quotation. Wait, wait, wait. Do you feel lucky punk? And a book title. What is, what is, over here, over here, what is it? Lucky? Moby Dick. Oh, Moby Dick. <laughs> so, so for the next two minutes, I ask you all to be silent so that Jacob can kind of focus his ideas and then he'll be up after those two minutes for a five minute presentation. So his two minutes starts right now.
ultimate goal of all mankind is to seek power. That unfortunately, that goal of seeking power ultimately leads to our destruction. Now, this is the first thing that I ended up thinking of when I received Moby Dick. Moby Dick is about a man that becomes so obsessed with hunting a whale because it stole his arm, effectively, <laughs> that he goes out to hunt this whale down. Now, this this ultimately leads to his destruction. He seeks to find this power over this whale. He goes and becomes obsessed with this. And this is exactly what this means to me. And this is a bad thing. That when we become obsessed with something to the point where it leads to our own destruction, that this is harmful to us. And we're going to be seeing this through three points of analysis. First, we're going to look at the children's book, Pierre. Then, we're going to look at the song, I Love It. Then, after that, we will finally look to The Honey Badger. <laughs> okay, so let's look to the book of Pierre. In the children's book, Pierre, this child basically says, I don't care. My name is Pierre, and I don't care. Pierre goes out of his way to be completely indifferent. He becomes so obsessed with not caring that he ultimately gets eaten by a lion. And it's only after he finally starts caring that he gets taken out of the lion, and he actually starts to love life and live it. Now, if Pierre had not given up this obsession of not caring, he would have stayed in a lion and been digested, and we have lion fertilizer. But <laughs> we can see that because he gave up this obsession and actually started to care and actually gave up this quest effectively for power over his life to be indifferent towards everything, he was able to better himself. Now, let's look to the song I Love It. In the song I Love It, what ends up happening is this girl is singing about how she's going around destroying all of her former lover's stuff, and how she drove her car into a bridge, how she threw all of his stuff into a lake or a river, and how she goes through, and she's just talking about all these terrible things that she's doing. But we can see that with her obsession of getting back at this person who she was involved with, this leads to an extreme amount of destruction of his personal property. That ultimately, even though you may side with the woman in the song, it leads to his destruction. It leads to a harming of himself. And so we can see that with this, he was unfortunately left without his car and his stuff. <laughs> so finally, let's look to the honey badger. I'm sure that you have all heard, well, the honey badger just doesn't care. I'm not going to speak with the actual term because there might be children in the audience. But the honey badger doesn't care. Now, when the narrator is talking about what the honey badger doesn't care about, basically the honey badger goes around and just starts tearing things up. Gets into a wasp's nest, gets stung by the wasp, doesn't care. Gets into the honey, gets stung by bees, doesn't care. Attacks larger animals, viper, doesn't care. But what ends up happening here, again, is that this not caring, this obsession to just go off and do whatever the person wants, or whatever the creature wants, ultimately leads towards destruction. So today, we've seen that, we've seen through the book Pierre, we've seen through the song I Love It, and we've seen through the Honey Badger, how the ultimate, or how, how obsession ultimately leads to destruction, and that this is definitely a bad thing. So when we look back to the quotation that was presented at the very beginning, that the ultimate goal of mankind is to seek power, and that unfortunately this power that we seek leads to our destruction, we can see that this is in fact very clearly laid out. So when you go out into your lives, you should be assertive, but don't become so obsessed like with Moby Dick you end up losing an arm and dying. <laughs>
we've now come to the final event of the evening. A parliamentary debate. Parliamentary debate actually has a really rich history with Modesto Junior College for a really important reason. My predecessor was Mr. Dr. Charles Ewing. And Dr. Ewing had the opportunity to go overseas for a sabbatical and saw the British Parliament at work. But then also because he was a debate coach, he came to realize that there was competition in throughout Europe that had to do with this format of debate called parliamentary debate. And in those, de in those days, all the debate that was happening in the United States was considered what would be called policy evidence-based debate. And the students who competed in that were some of the fastest speakers alive. And debate was a really fast speaking event. And Dr. Ewing didn't really care for that. When he saw the parliamentary debate style, it was a much more friendly, conversational style of debate. And so he brought parliamentary debate back to the United States. And in the early 1990s, we introduced parliamentary debate to the Northern California debate circuit. And all of a sudden it caught on because parliamentary debate didn't need to have evidence. It was a more common knowledge based debate. And so it was a slower style. It was a more persuasive style of debate. The other thing that Dr. Ewing did was he began the very first speech night 20 years ago. And tonight is actually an extremely historic moment for speech night and a historic moment for competitive speech as well. Because actually within the past couple of years as debate coaches, we've looked at the individuals who are winning in debate and we've realized why has there never been a national champion debate team made up of only women? Why? Why is that not happening? Are we not promoting women in debate enough? And so it's only really been the past couple of years that we've been pushing for that. An example of what women are trying to overcome in debate, kind of even we look at the very first debate tournament of the year that we just finished with. And, and at that debate tournament, there were 22 open teams that broke to the elimination rounds. And of those 22 teams, only three of those teams were made up of both women debaters. I'm proud to say that one of those three teams were two of the debaters that you're looking at right now. Miss Carissa Autry and Kelly Gay Kierley. I broke them up today for this debate as well, but last spring they competed at our national tournament you know, just a community college tournament where all the community colleges in the nation come to. And those two just happened to come in second place in the nation. <laughs> to make this truly an all-female event, I then said, you know, I've got the talent to be able to put four strong, intelligent women in front of you this evening. I then made sure that one of the timers for the event was also one of our female debaters in Novice who took home a quarter finalist award last weekend at San Francisco. And then I also asked one of our instructors, Miss Tiffany Upton Benton, to come and rule over the debate so that truly this last experience this evening is the very first ever all-female parliamentary debate here for speech night. Please give them a round of applause.
first female debate. Very exciting. We'll just go ahead and get started with it, with our resolution. Our resolution reads, Resolved, MJC's free speech policies should be revised. We will entertain a speech from our Prime Minister of the Government Team, not to exceed four minutes. Please welcome Ms. Emily Akers. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to MJC Speech Night. The resolution we're debating today is MJC's free speech policies should be revised. First of all, we're going to give you some background information on this particular resolution in order to have a cleaner debate. Background point A. Currently, MJC security authors do not receive any schedule or notification of what kind of freedom of speech events are happening on the campus that day in the beginning of their shift. Background point B. Any college and non-college groups or individuals are to request advanced approval to ensure that no conflicts with scheduled, camp scheduled campus events happen. Background point three. The current MJC policy on freedom of speech areas only designates the stage northeast of the quad and the free speech boards located in the student center. However, most free speech events such as student organization groups, protests, and these other activities that we see going on out there currently have expanded to take over the whole grassy area quad in front of the student center. So this shows us that the wording in that specific policy is not up to date and is extremely vague. Our plan to fix these problems is as follows. First, MJC security officers will be given a schedule of freedom of speech events happening on the campus that day. Second, the wording of the free speech area policy will be reworded to include the whole grassy area in the quad in front of the student center. Our first argument for why we should adopt these revisions is that if security officers receive a schedule ahead of time, this would prevent unwanted conflict without the schedule conflict without the schedules. This requires them to figure out on their own whether or not those individuals are supposed to be there and have received their advanced approval. When security approaches these in individuals, often what happens, especially when they're promoting or protesting something they're passionate about, this leads to emotions being evoked and expressions of anger, often causing a scene or conflict which can escalate quickly that both parties would want to avoid in the first place. Our second argument and affirmation of this plan is that it avoids confusion. By revising the language, we are able to avoid any conflict that may arise from not being in the specific area outlined by the policy. Not only does this prevent the emotional reactions that I explained in our first argument, but it gets rid of the vague wording and rewards it to include the actual space that is already being used, which is that grassy area. Yes? Does this mean that you're going to allow multiple groups to be protesting in the same area? It can be, and that usually happens anyway. Um, so this helps the security do their job more efficiently, and this also leads to healthier campus culture where we are able to exercise our right to freedom of speech, unhindered by the security officers questioning us. So you can see from both of our arguments, making these re revisions would absolutely cut down on these conflicts from happening. This in turn allows for campus security to work more efficiently and give us the opportunity to improve campus culture through our right to freedom of speech, which, which can only benefit the MJC student body substantially. And for all these reasons, I urge you to sign an affirmative ballot. Thank you, Ms. Emily Akers. We will now entertain great clash from our opposition, leader of opposition, Carissa Autry. Not to exceed four minutes. Okay, so I just want to state that in debate, the affirmative team is required to meet the call of the resolution they are given. This resolution today states that they have to answer multiple policies, meaning that they have to show at least two changes that they are making that are going to solve the problems they call for today. And so basically what you're going to see is that we're going to put some analysis behind these arguments they have made and show you why they support negative ideas and why you're going to be voting a negative ballot today. First, I'm going to look at the um, disadvantage of limits. Limits are a very important thing in our society. The first argument I want to make is that everyone has personal limits. What I did during her speech was a violation of her personal limits and also limits that are provided in the debate. So 
So basically, um, limits protect students from unwanted exposure to just anyone's ideas. And uh, all colleges limit the place and time for free speech. So basically what their plan does is decrease limits placed on demonstrators by giving them more space. And what this means is that you're going to see with bigger zones, they increase the room for the limits to be broken. <laughs> Think about the statement, if you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. So basically, limits are broken by pushing emotionally charged issues and have a quick and uh, high increased risk of violence escalating. College students are consumers. Likewise, if you go to Macy's, you're going to expect that no one's going to come and invade your personal space by shoving a Bible into your hand. Basically, three things are going to happen because of this. Violence is going to escalate. The idea behind this is that my idea is better than your idea. But what this really translates to for people is that your idea is not equal to my idea and that your idea has no value to me, so I'm going to punch you in the face because of it. And so what this means is that with increased violence, um, the, the constant increase is going to lead to things like mass shootings, riots, outbreaks of massive proportion, and so basically with the increased risk of violence alone, the second thing that happens is it increases the cost of liability insurance to the school, therefore increasing the cost to the student. Any risk that it's going to be more expensive means that on to the third point is that MJC is the only school changing this policy. So people are going to stop coming to MJC. When people aren't coming to the school, that means that the cost of the students that do still show up is going to be even higher. So basically if you vote affirmative, you're guaranteeing that your tuition is going to increase and that uh, you're going to allow for more violence and dehumanization. On to the answers for their first uh, argument. Basically, it sounds good, but they have no proof of harm due to the lack of a list. How do we know we need to change it if there's nothing that has ever gone wrong before? Why change something that isn't even broken? On the second argument is basically A, B, C, and D show up. Four groups. Like they said, multiple people are going to show up. A through C are going to have their paperwork. They went through the proper policies and the proper um, formats to do this, so they're going to cooperate if approached. But what's going to be even worse is that D is going to be approached by security, and security is going to come at them with a defensive mindset because of the fact that they don't think they're supposed to be there. And so D is going to answer defensively due to either lack of knowledge of our policies, um, feelings of discrimination because they're the only group being approached, or uh, the fact that they're in an emotional state of mind because of the issue that they're pushing. And so basically this is just too many factors that could lead to a violent outcome. And what this means is that you can see this is solid evidence as to why you're going to be voting for the negative team today because the, all of that comes out of giving security a list is it's going to increase violence on our campus. Answering their second argument, it's not difficult to understand. The policies are very simple. The area is in the north northeast section of the quad. And so basically a bigger space is just going to be harder to control in the event of a um, large outbreak. If you allow conflicting groups to come out into the grassy area, for instance, um, a religious group versus an LGBTQ group, all you're going to see is conflict because these issues are emotionally charged. Innocents are going to be hurt in the crossfire. You need to remember all of the information that I gave you in my uh, argument on limits. Basically, if you um, increase violence and dehumanization, it just escalates further and further. What this means is it's going to increase the cost to the students because of the increased liability. With this increased cost, since JC is the only school that's going to be implementing this, you're going to see that it's going to decrease students coming here, therefore increase the cost even further. I don't want to pay more to come here. I don't think you do either. This is why you're going to be voting for the negative today. <laughs> whatsoever, and we're going to be going into those reasons um, to begin with. So um, first, she talked about how on the first advantage of our plan, how we're basically giving the security a list of what's going to happen. She said that violence is going to increase because, because if you give an inch, then we're going to be giving a mile and that there's no harm and that basically she was saying that if we give security information about who's going to be there, that violence is going to increase. But that actually doesn't make any sense whatsoever because if you allow security to know what's going to happen and when it's going to be happening and who is supposed to be there, 
then you're going to be able to, the security is going to be able to recognize that A, B, and C are there. And when D is handing out something else that they didn't need to know, one, security, uh, security has been shown, they, they've gone through the training, that they're supposed to be going up to the protesters where they're not, supposed to go, they're not supposed to be going up, cussing up the storm and being like, hey, you guys are not supposed to be here. No, they don't do that. They're, very, they're calmly asking for, for their paperwork in this case on what's happening right now. So security doesn't go up there and is very violent to them and it won't be escalating through violence. What security is just trying to do, what's happening in the, in the status quo right now and what we're trying to help is not how, is to have security go through and make sure that they know that the people who are protesting, protesting are supposed to be there, and that they're not stepping out of line because that's why we have the that's why we have these rules. And so she talked about how um, if you give an inch, then they'll take a mile. We're not giving we're they're not going to be taking a mile because the scenario that I believe that she might have brought up was um, how basically if we allow this to happen by extending the limits, then we're then. Basically, people will be able to protest anywhere that we want, but we're not extending it into the classroom area. The, the rules that have that are in place right now allow us to be able to protest in a, in a general area where learning isn't taking place. So we're not disturbing people. We're not disturbing learning. We're just allowing the protesting to happen in an open in an open area. And so she said that it could lead to a violent outcome. However, this isn't going to be leading to an out into a violent outcome. So going on to the second, the second argument that my partner brought up and about, about how basically the security won't be going in and, and disturbing other people, she talked to, uh, first it came up and said that this will allow for com conflicting groups and this will create more confl com conflict and this will create a cost in it intuition and everything. However, my partner already brought up how this is happening right now. Right now, two opposing groups are able to go up there and protest, and violence isn't happening. So what she's saying, how violence is going to increase, and so the liability insurance is going to go up, which will increase tuition. None of that is going to happen because it's already happening in the status quo, and we don't need to increase, and we aren't increasing liability insurance right now. Um, so going on to, on to her limits, on to her limits disadvantage and how she talked about how everyone has limits and that if the plan happens that we're going to be decreasing limits because there's more space for limits to break. We're not decreasing limits. What we are doing is we are having what's happening right now. We're just writing that down. So, so all the security that she's saying that we're going to need more security, no we don't because security already, we already have enough security to be able to have control over that. And she talked about how violence is going to increase and so you're going to have to pay more in tuition and how the amount of students is going to decrease. That's not going to be happening. That's just a slippery slope, which is basically saying that one thing is going to lead to a, a bigger thing and bigger thing and bigger thing. She's making it spiral out of control when that's not what's going to happen whatsoever. Okay. And so basically, all the all of our affirmative things that we've been saying, which she's trying to say as a negative thing, that isn't going to be happening whatsoever. So for all these reasons, please vote affirmative. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly Kay, hear me. Great job. That's a challenging position to take. Summary, summary, and then your argument. Very well done. All right, and now we will listen to our last constructive speech from the member of opposition, a speech not to exceed four minutes, Ms. Rachel Carr. Okay, so. Today we're talking about NJC's free speech policy should be revised by changing the boundary guideline or violating another essential part of NJC's policy. These are just the desk or junior college policies. These are statewide policies put um, on free speech place to minimize disruption to the ordinary operations of the college. And Disney actually encourages individuals' rights and the rights of the student by hosting events and allowing free speech on campus, as long as they're prepared, as long as they're prepared to abide by reasonable time, place, and manner guidelines. By the affirmative team revising the boundaries of the free speech zone, they're violating our policy that the person using, using the area cannot impede on the progress of the passerby. Now, they're going to be putting the rally crowd, people handing out pamphlets, right in the main walkway of our school. So, um, when we come to campus for the sole purpose of education, we're paying for it. And I shouldn't be bothered by people trying to hand me pamphlets or trying to get me to sign up or stuff when I'm just on my way to class. I would look, like if I only have four minutes to get to class, I just want to get there and I don't want to be bothered by people. Um, it's kind of like when my partner Carissa came up here and was kind of um, violating personal limits of Emily. It was just kind of awkward for everyone watching. It was just really weird. Um, it's like when you go to the taco truck 
and like a million people are there asking you for change, and you just want to get your car to the side of the window and go. Well, I'm just here for my education. I just want to go to class and go home, and I don't want to be bothered with people while I'm here. So the next disadvantage of their plan is that with increased area for free speech, we're going to see more people, um, allowing for more people to reserve these newly implemented free speech areas. ASMJC, they can't turn down somebody for an application to reserve the space um, based on who has already reserved the space. So uh, with increased people, like that would be truly discouraging, discouraging free speech. So by allowing multiple groups to reserve the spots, we see an increase in the likelihood of conflict. To give you a better idea, as my partner said, this would be like a conservative religious fundamental group and an LGBT group um, protesting right next to each right next to each other. And people hold some values close to the heart, and when opposing groups are promoting their values or opinions, it can create a negative clash, which is an increase of, of violence, as my partner said. These boundaries are put in place to ensure civil liberties are enhanced rather than compromised, um, but with the higher chance of conflicts, we need more security, our school needs more liability insurance, and with that comes higher tuition. And who's going to deal with that when in the resolution MJC is the only school changing their policies to accommodate these things? So we'll see less students enrolling, which actually hurts our community and our school. So vote for the affirmative team hurts us as students. The final thought on the subject matter is that MJC cannot keep revising their policies to accommodate the boundaries that are continually being pushed. If we change the boundary now, then what will stop people from going farther and farther away from the designated area? Um, I could stand in front of my math class if I wanted to and talk about how numbers are the root of all evil and how I hate it. But if anyone says anything to me, I can boast about how they're impeding on my free speech and we need to change the boundaries. So we need to set limits for these people because if we give them an inch, they can take a mile and just keep knowing that we're going to keep revising to accommodate for it. And contrary to what most people believe, um, any property that's not in the free speech area, any YCCD college property, is actually um, a non-public forum, meaning that it's not public property. Um, so they're breaking limits when they speak there. And if you give them an inch, they can take a mile, more space, and <laughs> oh yeah, another major point here is that she says that people are going to feel discouraged when they're approached by security, but why would they feel discouraged if you know that you have the proper paperwork and you know that you're supposed to be there, then why are you going to be discouraged? If you're there just to get a message out, then when someone approaches you, you're just going to show him your paperwork and then continue with your message. And they say um, that there's vague wording in the policy. Have you guys ever read the policy? Because it's very clear. It says a little concrete area, and then on the west campus, it's actually the whole quad area in between the forums. Like, it's actually very clear in the policy where students are supposed to be, so I don't know where this confusion comes from. And they're not, they say that they're not increasing limits, that they're just changing the wording, but they're changing the wording to increase the limits. So that's why you're gonna vote opposition. Thank you. Rachel Carr. Thanks. Nice touches of humor were added there. We all enjoy that. All right, that brings us to the end of the constructive speeches for the parliamentary debate. We will now turn over to the rebuttals. I need to remind all of you debaters, which I'm sure you're more than aware, you may not bring up any new argumentation during your rebuttals. And this is your opportunity to persuade your audience on why you have won this round. At the end, you'll get to vote. So without any further ado, let's hear our first rebuttal from the opposition. Miss Emily, nope, Miss Carissa Akers. Sorry. Hey, Audrey. <laughs> Chris Audrey. You have two minutes. I'm going to make it really clear for you why you're going to be voting for the negative side today. Basically, like I said, they have to come up with two changes that are going to fix the resolution, fix the problems that are going on. First of all, they don't do that. As you said, as I said, all of their arguments come to the negative side. Basically, if you don't want to believe that I'm telling you that all their arguments come to the negative side, here's why they come to the negative side. Basically, first of all, when they're saying the increase of violence isn't going to happen and that uh, conflicting groups are already together, no, they're not. By giving them more space, all it's going to do is make it even more likely that it's going to happen. That's why the increased liability insurance is going to come up. When they say that this is just a slippery slope, basically, here's a little bit more analysis behind it. Another example for you to listen to. When you sign up for car insurance, us young people have to make more, pay more money because we have a higher risk of getting in an accident. Basically, what you can see is that the same, pro the same problem is going to apply to the college. When there's an increased risk of violence going to be happening, they're going to have to pay more money because of it. And so that's why you're going to see that this limits debate about how you're going to have to pay more money as a student is really going to happen because the risk goes up 
as I showed you, and so we are going to have to pay more money with that increased risk. Basically, their two arguments come to our side because when you increase the risk, as you do with allowing for more people in a space, like the Christian groups and the LGBT groups, the conflict risk increases, liability increases, cost increases, no one wants the cost to increase. On to their first argument, basically, all they have to say is that the security is going to be more informed. But if you look back to what I said, A, B, and C are going to cooperate. D is the one that's going to be mad. And D is going to be mad because they either don't know the policies, they feel discriminated against, or they are emotionally charged. This is why this argument comes to our side. So when you're looking at all of the arguments in this round today, all you have left is our impacts. Basically saying that you're going to have to pay more as a student, and you're going to be at risk of more violence. No one wants that to happen. It's probable, it's gonna happen, and it's gonna happen fast, spring semester. Please vote for the negative. <laughs> Thank you, Carissa Autry. Oh, good. I feel better now. <laughs> and our final rebuttal this evening is from our Prime Minister, Ms. Emily Hake. All right, thank you again, everybody, for being here tonight. Okay, it's game over for the negative team, and I'm going to give you several reasons why you're going to be voting for the affirmative. First, what they're completely missing is that we are only updating the wording in this policy to include what is already happening currently. We have all walked past that freedom of speech area, and it is shown that it does not just include that stage. It is that whole grassy area in order to accommodate all the freedom of speech activities that can happen in a given day. So their disadvantages to plan are hinged on that, that argument alone, so there, they go away. Um, and as I explained, um, the, that updating that policy is absolutely important for it to be accurate in order to avoid conflicts, as I explained in my first constructive. The second reason you're gonna be voting for the affirmative is that their arguments are completely hinged on slip, uh, like the slippery slope fallacy. They keep saying that, oh, if it's an inch, they're going to take a mile. I'm going to go in front of my math class. I'm Rachel, and I don't like numbers. But that's not going to happen. That's never going to happen. That's going to be slippery slope and it's flawed arguments, and you're not going to look to that. Um, th the third reason is that their argument that when boundaries are broken, clash of different groups is going to happen, and there's going to be violent outbreaks. As Kelly and I both explained to you, there are already different groups that protest or promote their club in that area at the same time, and we have not had a violent outbreak yet, so it's not going to happen. Um, the next reason is they do nothing to show you how, in my constructive, I showed you that freedom of speech is really important to our campus culture and life, and also by implementing this plan, you're going to let security have the job to do their, have the way to do their job more efficiently. So when you look at these arguments today that Kelly and I have presented with you, and you look at the ones that Rachel and Chris have presented to you, you're going to see that ours benefits the MJC student body more because it's helping our campus culture and helping our security officers do their job more efficiently. And for that reason, you're going to vote AF. Great job, ladies. That was a very informative, engaging, and entertaining thing. All right, so now is the moment in which you all get to participate. You get to make a decision here. You get to vote. So, through a round of applause, who would you, how many of you would support the affirmative? And then I always like to come on in the end and say, well, sounds like a tie. <laughs> Drive safe, have a good evening, and thank you for coming. <laughs>